It's our third speaker of the morning session. Uh, I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce for that Professor Jan LeCun. Uh, Jan uh, got an engineering a degree in electrical engineering, um, his PhD in computer science um, from the Université uh, Pierre et Marie Curie in Paris, and he did a postdoc with Jeff Hinton at the University of Toronto. Um, he's currently a uh, director of Facebook AI research and the silver professor at NYU. His primary field, uh, he lists as artificial intelligence and machine learning. And Jan is best known for his work in deep learning and really the invention of the convolutional neural network model, which is now widely used for image, video, speech, and text understanding. And I'm sure you'll hear much about that. So with that, please welcome Jan. Thank you, Jim. Well, thanks for the, to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I like, uh, I, I, don't, I don't consider myself a neuroscientist. I don't actually consider myself a computer scientist either. Um, I used to be an engineer. I'm not exactly sure what I am any, anyway. Um, so I probably sort of, you know, kind of fly in the middle of this diagram that Nico was showing earlier. Um, so I have, I have a question, which uh, is both a, a uh, a practical aspect and also kind of an aspect in terms of how the brain works, which is how is it that the brain learns so much so quickly? The models that we have, the AI models that we have, the machine learning models that we have, deep learning, etc., are not nearly as efficient as what we observe in biology in terms of how fast they can learn things, uh, how few trials they need, and you know how, how much of a big understanding of the world they get by just observing the world or playing in it. We can't do this with machines today, which means that we're missing an essential piece, which uh, evolution has figured out, but you know, we haven't figured out yet. And this is why um, you know, AI, AI researchers need neuroscience and cognitive science, I think. Uh, I certainly have had over the years a lot of inspiration from, from neuroscience, as I'll uh, tell you about a little bit, and I forgot to start my timer. Here we go. Um, Okay, so there's a number of questions I, uh, I'm interested in. Um, in his talk, um, you know, I had the advantage of like being able to modify my slide as Josh was talking. Um, he says all these AI systems that we see, none of them is real AI, and this is one of one of the uh, increasingly large number of things that Josh and I agree on. There's plenty of things we disagree on, but uh, we agree on this. Um, in fact, we tend to start our talks the same way nowadays, um, as, as you'll see in a minute. The the, the brain learns with an efficiency that none of our machines, uh, machine learning algorithms can match. And you know, our supervised learning algorithms require a lot of, of examples, or reinforcement learning algorithms require ridiculously large amounts of examples or trials to, to run anything, uh, which is why they basically only work for games. Um, they don't work in the real world. And that's why we don't have robots that are as agile as cats or rats or even simpler animals. That's why we don't have uh, you know, intelligent dialogue system and virtual assistants that are not frustrating and that uh, have common sense. So what's missing? And I think what I'm going to argue is that um, you know, we need new learning paradigms that basically build models of the world uh, from observation and action, and not just through reinforcement, not just through supervised learning, but through another type of learning called the predictive learning and supervised learning. And supervised learning is a bit of a generic word. Um, it's not a very different argument from kind of the main argument Josh had in his talk. Uh, so again, we agree on uh, a number of things. And that's the most important one, I think. So supervised learning, we all know what it is. Um, you have you know, some sort of parameterized function, a classifier, a deep learning, a deep neural net, where you, know, you adjust the the, the weights uh, as learning takes place, and you show it thousands of examples of cars on airplanes, and you know, whenever you show it a car, you tell it it's a car. If it doesn't answer a car, you measure some sort of error, and you kind of figure out how to adjust the knobs so that the error decreases. And it's nice because there is nice theories about this. It, you know, those things can generalize to objects, never, uh, to uh, views they've never seen before, instances they've never seen before. There is transfer learning, so if you, if you train one of those networks on lots of examples, you can, uh, add a new category with just very few samples, uh, which starts to look a little more like, like human and, and animal learning. Uh, but we're still very far from that. And you know, the, the way those uh, sort of modern recognition systems and machine learning systems are built is based on the idea of deep learning, which uh, is just the idea that you know, competition should have multiple steps, basically, that, and, and representation of the world should be hierarchical in some way. That's, that's all there is to deep learning, really. And then the question is, um, so you, you want to build a machine that has a cascade of parameterized nonlinear functions. They have to be nonlinear, otherwise there is no point having multiple layers. 
Uh, and then the next question you can ask yourself is what do you put in the box? And that's where you can get inspiration from neuroscience. So the, the sort of modern way of building neural nets is uh, you alternate two types of operations, sometimes three or four, but uh, in the simple case, just two. Uh, you see the activations of one layer as a list of numbers. You multiply it by a matrix. Uh, basically, you compute weighted sums. And then you pass the result to a pointwise nonlinearity, which in modern neural nets are just a half-wave rectifier. Uh, in old neural nets, it was a sigmoid, but we discovered that it's better to use just half-wave rectification. You can have neural nets with many more layers without running into problems when you do this. Um, and training takes place by optimizing some sort of objective function that you know, computes the discrepancy between what the machine produces and what you want. Uh, using uh, stochastic gradient descent, you estimate the gradient of this cost function with respect to the parameters, the connections between the virtual neurons, extremely simplified neurons, using the backpropagation algorithm. It's just you know, a gradient estimation, efficient gradient estimation. Um, and of course, you, know, you can get even more inspiration from biology, uh, not just neurons and you know, modifiable synapses and uh, you know, nonlinearity with uh, um, a threshold, but also in the kind of architecture and the connection between the, the neurons. So convolutional nets are kind of uh, very direct inspiration from you know, classic work by Hubel and Weasel, uh, which uh, you know, were translated into computer models by uh, Fukushima in the early 80s. And uh, I got inspired by this to kind of build models of this type that are trained with backpropagation. And they're, they really, I mean, they're composed of essentially three types of operations, linear operations, which are, are kind of filter banked, like receptive fields in V1 or uh, the visual cortex, plus a nonlinearity, and then the other operation is a pooling, which is very similar to um, um, complex cells, the Ubel and Weasel's uh, complex cells. And so this idea of uh, stacking uh, multiple layers, of course, a lot of people have um, uh, had this idea before in, in some sort of uh, conceptual model of how the visual perception or an auditory perception works. And as I said, the first com computational models that kind of started doing something vaguely useful were uh, the Fukushima has no cognitron, started working on this in the late 80s and got some success with character recognition. Uh, this is the, the kind of stuff that those old neural nets could do, uh, recognize characters very accurately. Pretty quickly we realized uh, that they had one quality that more classical uh, uh, pattern recognition system at the, at the time couldn't have, which was the ability to recognize multiple objects at the same time and to essentially partially solve the binding problem. So there is no explicit um, mechanism in those networks to, uh, to bind features together to form objects. Uh, there's just many layers and nonlinearities between them, and that seems to be enough to solve the binding problem. Uh, there was a lot of work in uh, uh, theoretical neuroscience in the 90s about uh, how, how does the brain solve binding problems by you know, uh, synchronization of spikes and, and you know, fast changing um, uh, synapses and things like this. And it turns out that doesn't seem to be uh, really required. Doesn't mean it's not there, doesn't mean it doesn't exist, doesn't mean it's not useful in general, but it, for this, it doesn't seem to be required. Um, so in the last few years, there's been sort of an explosion of uh, work on, on convolutional nets because they, they, with the advent of fast computers and GPUs and large data sets, uh, those things require a lot of data to be able to, um, to do a good job. Uh, the large data sets became only available in the last five years or so, and so that that's when the, the field started taking off of using neural nets for sort of practical applications, even though there were success before. And so we, you know, we have um, conventional nets that have, you know, on the order of one to 10 billion uh, connections. Uh, oops, I went a little too fast here. I'm not sure what happened. Um, you know, a few million uh, simplified neurons, um, anywhere from eight to 20 layers. This was uh, maybe four or five years ago. And when you trend and supervise the, the kind of filters that are learned, uh, the video unfortunately is not playing properly, uh, the, the, the filters that you end up uh, with are, are very much like, like V1 receptive fields, essentially, uh, or you know, at least qualitatively. Um, over the, la the last few years, uh, there's been a, an explosion and in inflation in the number of layers in those networks. And you, you, you don't want to think of the layers as physical layers, but more as steps of computation. So if you, if you think of the, the visual cortex, the, the ventral pathway of the visual, visual cortex, for example, as having recurrent connections within V1, within V2, within V4, each uh, path around the recurrence you could think of as, as a layer. And so the, the networks that are used in practice that are deployed by Facebook and Google and 
Microsoft, IBM, everybody else, um, have on the order of 50 to 100 layers now, or 50 to 100 kind of steps, you know, if you want, in the computation. And uh, all of them sort of computational in some way. Uh, and those are used on a big scale. There's a large amount of power spent running those things in uh, data centers, uh, you know, Facebook and Google's data centers. Uh, Facebook users upload something like 1.5 billion photos on Facebook every day, and every single one of those photos goes through four of those guys within two seconds. So a lot of it is spent there. So the advantage of this idea of uh, using multiple layers is just the idea that um, you want a representation of the world that is hierarchical, and the reason you want it to be hierarchical is because you want it to be compositional. Uh, the world is compositional. In fact, there is a nice... Uh, uh, quote from uh, Jason Eisner, who is a natural language processing researcher at Johns Hopkins, who says, uh, the world is compositional or there is a God. Um, it's the only way we can think of the world as being understandable, right? Einstein said, you know, the most un you know, incomprehensible thing about the world is that it's comprehensible, and it's probably because there is some compositional structure to it. So objects are formed of parts, you know, parts are formed of subparts and part, subparts of motifs and motifs of kind of elementary edges in the case of images, etc. And you have the same kind of hierarchy in language and text in uh, audio signals, just about any natural uh, signal. So um, you can train those things supervised to do all kinds of tasks, including, you know, driving uh, little robots around. Uh, you train the robot, you know, by kind of, um, this is a, a little, this is a very old project, uh, almost, uh, I guess, 13 years ago now. And you, you, you drive this little robot, uh, you know, in sort of busy uh, environments, and the, the conventional net just records the images on the camera and, and the steering angle, and then basically learns to avoid obstacles but, um, through imitation learning, essentially. Um, you can be a little more sophisticated about this and, and drive robots. Uh, I'll show you a video at the end if I have time, which I probably won't. Um, and a lot of ideas of using conventional nets, not just to recognize objects, but to basically label the entire environment. So you can, um, this, is, this is more of the, 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 the classical convolutional nets you can think of as being the ventral pathway. This is more the dorsal pathway. So instead of uh, really sort of, you know, precisely classifying everything, you basically tell where everything is. And uh, without necessarily having very accurate cl classification, but, but very good localization. And you can imagine that this kind of stuff is very useful if you want to drive cars around. Uh, so this, this is a little video from a company called Mobileye that was recently bought by Intel that builds a lot of the vision systems for certain self-driving cars. NVIDIA, the company that makes the GPU chips, is also working very actively on this and um, using those things on a grand scale for, for autonomous driving. Um, there's been some interesting work at, uh, at Facebook, uh, which I guess in the context of computational neuroscience can be interpreted as sort of trying to merge ventral and dorsal uh, uh, pathway functionalities to enable a machine to not just recognize objects, but localize them and not just localize people in general, but individual instances of each object. Uh, and it's kind of amazing uh, that this works, but it works really very well. And it's conceptually very simple. It's a big convolutional net where the output is a bunch of masks for each object. And, and categories, associated categories, and it's trained supervised or semi-supervised in some ways. And the results are nothing short of astonishing, where you, know, you can pretty much um, you know, see that every object is outlined or colored in that case um, and, um, and identified, including instances that overlap, like the sheeps in the, in the top right. Um, so this is something that where uh, deep learning has brought about progress that people did not expect would happen so fast. So if you'd asked a computer vision researcher five years ago or 10 years ago, how long is it going to take for us to solve that problem? You know, they might have said 20 years or maybe not within my career or something. Um, so it's kind of it's kind of great that we've been able to to do this, and that's what created the you know big interest from industry for those for those methods. Um, and you know all of this is great, but you need to collect a lot of data and have it labeled by humans to be able to do all those things and figure out you know what pose people are taking and things like that. Um, the supervised learning works when you have enough resources to collect data. In fact, convolutional nets are used at Facebook for translation. So some of the language pairs that Facebook automatically trans uh, translates uh, when a post is, is made in one language and 
Facebook knows you don't understand that language, it translates automatically. And some of the translation systems use convolutional nets. They're applied to the kind of a text sequence. Uh, it's a sequence of words, essentially, where words are represented by vectors, and it goes to a convolutional net that kind of produces an abstract representation of the meaning of the sentence, and then another deconvolutional net, which is sort of a convolutional net backwards, if you want, that kind of generates the translation. Um, so it's kind of a bit of a general tool. But there are lots of questions that are left uh, in the air if we are interested in uh, how, uh, uh, how the brain works or really what intelligence is all about. Um, so one question I've, I've been asking myself um, and, and you know, getting different answers from different people is, is how many learning algorithms does the brain implement? And you know, I, put, I put quotes around algorithm because we know, you know it's not clear uh, whether that is best described by, by the world algorithm. Um, so is it close to one or maybe a few? Um, you know, one general algorithm for the, for the cortex, if you want. Is there an algorithm with the cortex? And you know, of course, there would be different ones for you know the hippocampus and the cerebellum and stuff like that. That's okay. There's still a small number, um, but there are people who say that um, no, it's just a clue, right? Evolution just you know kind of cobbled this thing together so that it, it would work, and there is no hope of finding any general principle behind its uh, its function. Uh, Gary Marcus is one of those, a colleague at NYU in the psychology department, and uh, he, he's made that point that in fact he has a book. Uh, whose title is Kluge, that describes how the brain is a collection of hacks, essentially. So if he's right, then the whole enterprise of trying to figure out how the brain works from first principle is not gonna, it's not gonna succeed, essentially. Um, but whether it's true or not, I'd like to use the hypothesis that is true and push this as much as we can. Um, how much prior structure, this is another question that also Gary Marcus is interested in, and um, I assume many people in the audience, how much prior structure does animal learning require, and human learning, and of course machine learning. So convolutional nets are an example of imposing some structure in a mach machine learning system so that it learns the concepts that are relevant, and it represents them in, in sort of appropriate fashion. But how much such structure is required if you want to build sort of an end-to-end -end intelligent system? It's, um, that question is completely in the air. Um, is there something really special about the visual cortex, for example, compared to the frontal cortex? What's different? Is it something that's really relevant or not? Or is the cortex just kind of a uniform piece of goo that, you know, learns whatever it's fed? Um, it's the old nature-nurture debate. Uh, this is actually what got me to machine learning in the first place, kind of reading about this in, um, uh, like, debates between psychologists and linguists, you know, Chomsky and Piaget and people like this. Um, so all of our learning algorithms are designed as, are sort of based on the idea of minimizing some sort of objective function. That's what makes them sort of well-principled. You will have a hard time getting a paper accepted in a machine learning conference unless your machine learning algorithm minimizes some sort of objective function. Um, but if the brain minimizes an objective function, first of all, does it minimize an objective function? Uh, even if it's implicit, right? Um, and if it does, um, what would that function be? It would probably be a collection of, of multiple functions, but what, what would it be? And then the next question is, um, how does it minimize it? So all the efficient algorithms we have evaluate gradients by backpropagation. You know, you estimate the gradient using backpropagation, that's very efficient. When you have non-differentiable uh, parts in your learning system, uh, you kind of have to evaluate the gradient by perturbation. It sort of works, but it's really, really inefficient. And so um, uh, I don't think it's kind of a, a very common principle for efficient learning. Um, gradients really work really well. And I don't know any alternative to this. Um, so, you know, does the brain do backprop? You know, I'm, I'm not talking about supervised learning necessarily, but is there a way? Um, Joshua maybe is going to talk about this later. Here is Joshua. Hi, Joshua. Uh, he's been working on like you know explaining how um, like trying to f find forms of uh, gradient evaluation that could be biologically plausible. And then one important question that I'll come back to a little later is how does the brain handle uncertainty in prediction? Uh, so this is something uh, you know where Josh immediately jumps to uh, saying, uh, well you know probabilistic models, and I I'm wary of probabilistic models because probability distributions in high-dimensional spaces are horrible objects that we can't represent. Um, pardon? Another big 
and also, also we agree on. Yeah, but but you know, I'm I'm perfectly ready to uh, uh, you know throw probability theory under the bus. You know. <laughs> our trajectories are converging. Um, yes. So, uh, you know, what's, what's the obstacle to AI? Why is it that we don't have machines that, uh, you know, can learn to uh, navigate the world as, as well as a cat? Uh, what is it that we don't have uh, uh, systems that can learn language as, uh, as well and as efficiently and, and how the world works as, as kids? Or orangutans. We had an example of orangutans. Amazing animals. They're not social. They don't have language. They're solitary animals. They're incredibly smart. Almost as smart as we are. Probably smarter in some ways. Um, so, um, you know, the punchline before, before I go into this is that uh, our AI systems need to learn uh, models of the world. And they need to be able to use them to reason and plan. And again, I'm, you know, it's very similar to what Josh was saying. Um, so, you know, common sense is kind of a recurring uh, sort of holy grail kind of question in AI, like how can machines get common sense? There is something in AI called common sense reasoning, which doesn't mean there are methods to do this. It's a problem. It's not a solution. Um, but, uh, but common sense, perhaps, if you kind of reduce it to something uh, concrete, is the ability to fill in the blanks. So, for example, the ability to infer the state of the world from partial information. Um, from, say, visual information. You don't see everything about the world, but you can infer a lot of information about the world uh, through vision, even though you have only a partial description of it. Infer the future from the past and the present. Predicting the future is very important for intelligence. In fact, arguably, it's the essence of intelligence. Infer past events from the present state of the world, like what happened. Um, filling your visual field, you know, there's low-level functions of this type, filling the, the retinal blind spot um, in your visual field. Uh, we're not conscious of it because our brain fills it up, you know, at kind of a relatively low level, below, you know, at a subconscious level. Um, and that is probably based on some sort of prediction. Uh, you know, we can predict how the world is going to look uh, if we move our, our head 20 centimeters to the left. And that's because we've kind of abstracted the notion of depth and, you know, objects that are in front of others and things like this. And we probably learned this uh, at a young age. Um, so depth is kind of an emergent property of being able to predict what the world is going to look like when you move your head. Um, so, predicting any part of the past, present, or future percepts from whatever information is available, I think, is the underlying uh, ability that from which common sense can emerge. But what we need here is a way to train machines to kind of do those predictions. And that's what, generically, a lot of machine learning people have called unsupervised learning, although that means a lot of other things. So I prefer another phrase for it, predictive learning which doesn't mean necessarily predict in the future, but predict whatever is missing. Um, and unsupervised learning, unfortunately, is kind of like the dark matter of AI in the sense that uh, um, you know, all of the stuff you see about AI is all supervised learning and reinforcement learning. Uh, but, but really, most of learning, most of animal learning is unsupervised, and we don't know how to do this. So it's sort of like physicists who tell you um, you know, we know ordin ordinary matter is like 5% of the mass of the universe, and the other stuff, the 95%, we have no idea what it is. You know, dark matter, dark energy, et cetera. We really have no idea. So the same kind of embarrassing situation. Um, so, you know, we, we learn how the world works by observation. Uh, you know, we learn, we learn um, um, you know, object permanence, like this baby here on the top right. Um, we learn all kinds of basic things about the world very early on in the first few months. Uh, this orangutan here figured out that an object cannot disappear uh, by magic. Um, and so he's totally fooled by this uh, little simple magic tour and kind of roll, roll on the floor laughing when he realizes the object is not there. Um, <laughs> right? So a break in your model of the world is either funny or scary or surprising. And in fact, that's exactly how... Uh, Psychophysicist and, or, or you know, child development uh, psychologist, uh, you know, test uh, whether something is 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 kind of understood by a baby or kind of breaks the model of the world, right? You push this little this little uh, track here off of a thing and it doesn't fall, and you know, below the age of six to eight months, the uh, babies just you know don't care. Say sure, yeah, right, yeah, why not? 
And after eight months, they, they say, wait, wait, uh, this can't be, you know, this thing has to fall. Um, and so they, they look at it like the, the baby on the bottom left here, and that's how you can measure whether, you know, the model is being violated. And so Emmanuel Dupoux in, in, in France, at uh, Economie Supérieure in France, has kind of ma made this chart of all kinds of different stages at which, uh, you know, a number of months at which we learn those, those basic uh, concepts. Uh, like, you know, recognizing biological motion from, from sort of uh, uh, basic objects. Object permanence we learn pretty quickly uh, within two months, but it still takes two months. Uh, rigidity, stability, and support, you know, the, 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 the towers of, uh, of cubes that uh, from um, my colleagues at Facebook that Josh were, were, were showing is kind of that kind of thing. And then gravity comes, you know, around eight months, uh, et cetera. Um, motor control comes later than perception. Babies learn perception much, much earlier than motor control. Um, and so the idea that somehow you need to interact with the world to perceive it is not, it's, it's not clear. It's not clear how much of it you need. But there is another argument for unsupervised learning, uh, which is an argument Jeff Hinton has been making for, you know, 30 years. Uh, which I didn't quite believe at first because I didn't know how to define unsupervised learning. But his argument goes like this. It says, the brain has about 10 to the 14 synapses and we only live for about 10 to the 9 seconds. So we have a lot more parameters than data. This motivates the idea that we must do a lot of unsupervised learning since the perceptual input is the only place where we can get 10 to the 5th dimensions of constraints per second. In other words, it says, you know, predict everything you observe because that's the only way you can constrain a large brain enough uh, to learn, you know, all the parameters it has. If you only ask it to predict a couple of labels or a value function, you're going to require millions and millions and millions of examples, and you're never going to be able to learn anything, essentially, in, in your lifetime. Um, so that led me to this uh, obnoxious analogy, obnoxious to certain people, um, which, has, which is if you want to quantify the amount of information that a machine is, is given, the amount of feedback a machine is given and asked to predict, in different modes or paradigms of learning. In the case of reinforcement learning, so reinforcement learning is uh, you know, the, the scenario in machine learning where you don't tell the machine the correct answer, you just wait for it to produce an answer and you tell it whether it was good or bad, essentially, a single scalar at every trial. Supervised learning, you give the correct answer, and so if it's you know, one among a thousand categories, that's something like 10 bits, uh, so you give you know, quite a bit more information to it, so it's gonna learn things you know, with less effort. Uh, and unsupervised learning, you ask the machine to predict everything, basically. Um, tell me what your complete perception is going to be in the next second, minute, hour, days. Uh, and so the machine has to do a lot, and it only needs to wait for the future to occur to get the feedback. And you get a lot of information from, from that. That's the only way you can kind of get enough information to train a large uh, system, and that's the only way the, a, mach a machine or, or an animal can learn model of the world, predictive models of the world. So it's kind of, it's become sort of obvious to me that um, that is something that we need to be able to do with machines. That said, um, so basically, you know, I was talking about the dark matter of AI being, uh, you know, being unsupervised learning. In this case, the dark matter is actually chocolate, genoise, um, which is sort of yummy. Um, that said, you know, we do work on reinforcement learning at Facebook. Um, you know, traditional reinforcement learning uh, for, you know, playing violent games or playing other violent games. Um, uh, this is very interesting kind of vehicles for, you know, developing sort of end-to-end -end AI systems that learn to act and perceive and everything. Um, but here is where I really want to go. Um, Rich Sutton, a number of years ago in 1991, uh, proposed an architecture, an architecture he called Dyna, uh, which, uh, in which he has this argument. The main, the main idea of Dyna is the old common sense idea that planning is trying things in your head using an internal model of the world. This suggests the existence of a more primitive process for trying things not in your head, but through direct interaction with the world. Reinforcement learning is the name that we use for this more primitive direct kind of trying. And Dyna is the extension of reinforcement learning to include a learned world model. Now, truthfully, all of this now is called reinforcement learning. It's just that uh, what he called the uh, you know, reinforcement learning with a model is called model-based reinforcement learning. Um, but a lot of people call, you know, a lot of things reinforcement learning that may not necessarily deserve the name. Um, and this based on kind of, uh, I mean, it, there's some parallels with the classical idea of uh, um, optimal control. 
So in optimal control, when you want to, I don't know, you know, plan the trajectory of a, NASA plans the trajectory of a rocket, okay, using uh, simulation, it has uh, an accurate model of the rocket, numerical model of the rocket, and it has two functions for it. It knows how to compute the next state from the current state and the commands, and also it knows how to propagate gradient through it. It's basically using backprop. Uh, in control theory, they called it the adjoint, uh, adjoint system method, but it's really basically backprop in time. Uh, they invented it way before machine learning people. And so you have essentially a simulator that uh, of the thing you want to control, which is different, a differentiable function for which you can compute the, the, the gradient, the, the, the derivative of the output with respect to the inputs. And this thing, you know, you simulate it, you know, step by step, discrete time. Every time you feed a, a command, uh, you know, position in the nozzles for a rocket or whatever it is. And there's an objective, which is, you know, get to the space station by, you know, minimizing fuel consumption and, you know, not taking too long or something. Um, and what you do is by gradient descent to backprop through time, essentially, you figure out a sequence of commands that minimize the objective function. You can propagate through all those modules very easy. This is how also uh, sort of classical robotics does planning, uh, trajectory planning. So you have a model, a perfect dynamical model of the robot you want to control. And you have some specification of the constraints and the cost. You don't want to hit uh, obstacles too, too close, you know, things like this. Minim minimize jerk and, uh, and do a particular task. And, and you do this planning this, that way, essentially. So that perhaps suggests an architecture for the intelligent system, which would be something like this. Uh, intelligent system interacts with the world. It produces actions uh, to the world that you know, possibly affect the state of the world. And in return, it gets percepts or observation that go through a perception module. And we know how to, kind of, how to build this, although we have to use supervised learning to train it. That representation of the perceptual world goes into an agent. And the agent is trying to optimize some sort of objective function that measures an overall cost. So this objective function measures unhappiness, essentially. And it takes the internal state of the agent as an input and tells the agent you're happy or not happy. Now, if we believe in this idea of sort of model-based, like you know, prediction, having a way of predicting what the world is going to do, so that you can think about, think ahead about what kind of action you want to take, um, inside of the agent, there has to be some sort of world simulator, a world model, that can predict what where the world is going to is going to do, either because the world is being the world or as a consequence of uh, the uh, actions of the agent. There's an actor, so this is the actor critic kind of bingo here. Uh, that generates action proposals that are fed to the world simulator that you know, generates predicted precepts or, um, or, or world state. And that goes into a critic, and the role of the critic is to predict the long-term expected value of the objective. So it's a predictor for the objective function. You don't want to be able to just you know, optimize the objective function instantaneously. You want to predict the long-term consequences of your actions without actually necessarily taking them. Um, so all of those modules are trainable. The world model has to be an emulator of the world. Um, the actor, of course, has to learn to generate action proposals that will minimize the objective, and the critic has to learn to predict the long-term expected value of the objective. Um, and again, this is kind of, you know, I wouldn't say completely classical, but relatively classical uh, models in reinforcement learning, and uh, particularly in sort of, uh, you know, models of, of how the brain is organized and, and, you know, the reward mechanisms and all that stuff. So. In a typical uh, trial, you would observe the state of the world, run a sequence of actions produced by the actor, uh, predict the effect using the world simulator, and perhaps you might do a little bit of optimization to figure out a sequence of actions that would lead to a particular result um, predicted by the, by the critic, and, and then just train the actor to produce that sequence that actually optimizes um, the objective function. So, the main problem in there is that we kind of know how to train the actor and the critic. We have no idea how to train the world simulator. That's kind of the main technical issue, I think, that we are facing in AI today. It's a, this is a very personal opinion. Not everybody agrees. Few people agree, actually. But, um, but the main problem is, how do we train forward models of the world? And so Josh showed this uh, work by uh, Adam Lehrer, Sam Gross, and Rob Fergus at, at, at Facebook on you know, trying to kind of do intuitive physics, uh, training a conventional net to predict how cubes are going to fall. And, when there is uncertainty, what you see is that those predictions where cubes are going to fall become fuzzy. So I don't know if I can uh, uh, point to any particular example here, but 
Uh, here you see the, it's hard to predict where this uh, yellow block is going to fall, and so the prediction is fuzzy. And it's because the thing cannot, you know, has to kind of predict an average of all the possible futures that can happen. Um, we can actually train uh, forward models to, uh, you know, simulate various physical uh, systems. I'm actually going to skip this. Uh, because it's going to take a little too long, but you can use them to sort of optimize uh, policies and, and uh, um, sequences of actions. Um, there's various uh, work which I'm going to skip also in sort of predicting, uh, using prediction to help train dialogue systems. So there's some work by Jason Weston and his coworkers that shows that if you train a dialogue system to predict what the next uh, series of um, uh, sentences that are going to be uh, typed or spoken are going to be, uh, then this dialogue system does a better job at actually adapting uh, if you train it with re reinforcement learning, uh, um, satisfying the answers of the user. Um, it's quite a lot of work on this. Um, okay, um, so let me jump in the last four minutes on to uh, adversarial training. So this is a new technique that was proposed by Ian Goodfellow, who was uh, a student in Yosha Benjo's lab. Uh, I mean, I'm sure Yosha had to, something to do with it as well. Uh, and it's a very cool idea. Uh, and one problem that it might help us solve is the problem of predicting under uncertainty without necessarily appealing to probability theory um, or to kind of modeling uh, distributions in general. So, for example, let's say that we uh, let a machine observe a few frames of a video, like you know me putting a, a pen on the table, and then I'm going to let the pen go, and the pen you know will fall. It's very hard to predict in which direction it's going to fall. And um, we're going to train a neural net here, g of x and z. So x is the, uh, the past, the you know, observed frames. And z is kind of a source of random uh, uh, vectors. And the machine is going to make a prediction. The prediction may be that, for example, the pen is going to fall to the left and to the back. But in fact, when we let uh, the future play out, uh, the pen falls to the back and, and slightly to the right. So technically, the machine is not wrong. It predicted kind of qualitatively the right thing, but it's technically wrong because the frame it's predicting is not the one that actually occurred. So what we'd like is to be, have a way to tell the machine, OK, your prediction was actually OK. You know, it, it's part of a set of possible futures that are plausible, and I want to punish you for making the wrong prediction, picking the wrong one within that set. So what you want is uh, an objective function that tells the machine any of those answers are correct or are OK, and it's only if you go outside of this set that things are, things are bad. And the problem is that we have no idea how to characterize the set of correct uh, plausible futures. So what we're going to have to do is train a second neural net to learn that function. And that's the idea of adversarial training. You have two neural nets, one that learns to predict, and one that is used to assess the prediction of the first one. And they're both trained at the same time. So um, in the sort of non-probabilistic version of it, basically your observed data is a bunch of points. And you want to give low energy to them, so you want the thing that assesses whether something is plausible um, to output a low number. And for everything else that is not plausible, you want this uh, network to give a, a high number. And this is called you know, energy-based uh, learning in general. So this is how it works. You have uh, a data set that actually produces the actual feature and the generator, a neural net that looks at the past and predicts the, uh, predicts the future, currently is doing a really bad job. And those two predictions go to the discriminator, the second neural net that is uh, supposed to assess whether a prediction is good or bad. The way you train the discriminator is that you tell it to produce a low output whenever you feed it real data, and you tell it to produce a large output whenever you feed it uh, predictions from the generator. But now simultaneously, the generator is going to train itself to produce outputs that the discriminator can't tell are, are fake. Okay, So it's going to get the gradient of the output of the discriminator with respect to its inputs, and it will change its parameters in such a way as to produce outputs that the discriminator think are correct, are real. So you know, it learns this kind of contrast function that I kind of drew in the, on the right here. The green points are generated are produced by the generator. The blue points are the real ones. And eventually, this function kind of shapes itself, and the green points kind of move towards the middle. And those things are amazing, because you can train them to generate images. These are non-existing bedrooms where you put a bunch of random numbers in, you get bedrooms out. You can do uh, funny arithmetics in uh, feature space, uh, which I don't have time to explain. You can generate funny looking images that are, look like you know, surreal art, you know, like uh, Salvador Dali dogs or something. Um, you can do video prediction. 
So there are sh uh, short segments where the first four frames are observed and the last two frames are predicted. And it kind of predicts more or less what's going to happen. It gets bad really quickly if you keep going. Um, uh, same here. Uh, so here the system has been trained on uh, video segments of uh, New York apartments. And as the camera rotates, it's, it has to predict what the apartment looks like in places it hasn't seen. So it continues the, the bookshelves and the couches and, and everything. And again, it goes bad really quickly. Um, this is another example where here the prediction is not in pixel space, but in sort of the space of semantic segmentation. So we have categories for every, uh, every region. And it predicts that you know, if someone starts crossing the street, it's going to keep crossing the street. If a car starts to turn left, it's going to keep turning left. So um, let's see. I have one last slide. Um, so in this uh, AI agent architecture, the problem is how do we design the objective function? And we can't really design them because they are kind of complicated. So we're going to need to learn them. And this is kind of a big subject of discussion in the AI community, particularly on people who are worried about like AI being dangerous. Uh, we're going to have to train our AI systems to behave. And that will have to be done by training their objective function, not just hardwiring them. So you know the three laws of robotics and et cetera, that's kind of the hardwiring, although it's kind of difficult to do. Uh, but the rest is we're going to have to you know, teach them good from evil, essentially, um, the way we raise children. And it turns out that's very similar to um, um, you know, how we train children. Um, I want to end with just this slide. To, uh, you know, I've been very inspired by, uh, by neuroscience in, uh, in my work, but sort of very sort of conceptual uh, things from neuroscience. That's the real, how do you stop this? Okay, so it's over then. It's over. <laughs> um, but there's a word of caution. If you, if you try to stick to neuroscience too closely without really understanding the underlying principles, uh, you might be sort of hypnotized or blinded by the details without actually, you know, finding the underlying principles. So uh, one question I've been asking myself is, um, is there a general principle behind intelligence that is used, could use, you know, by, by biology at one end, you know, the animal world, but that we could sort of use for machines that would play a similar role as aerodynamics plays for aeronautics and thermodynamics for, you know, heat engines and things like that. Um, and uh, that's what I'm after. Thank you.